How can you power a spacecraft over 20 billion kilometers from Earth? At this distance, any conventional fuel would be long gone, and the moving parts in the engine would likely be worn out. Any battery would have died many years ago, and out here the light from the sun is far too weak for solar to be an option. Operating in this environment requires a special way of producing power, and an equally special material at its heart. This is the story of Silicon Germanium. If you've never wondered how deep space probes like this are powered, you're probably not alone. Space applications in general are a bit of a niche thing, and this type of probe is a niche within that niche. Since we need a small, reliable trickle of power over a long period of time, decades even, this is the solution, what's known as a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Basically, a radioactive element releases heat as it decays, and a thermoelectric generator generates power from the heat produced. These are amazing devices, and this video would be hours long if we talked about every unique engineering aspect that goes into their construction, but since this is a material science channel, let's focus on this thing here, silicon germanium, a material known for its thermoelectric properties. The thermoelectric effect describes the relationship between a temperature difference and a voltage in materials. It's possible to produce a temperature difference by applying a voltage. This is called the Peltier effect, and you'll occasionally see this used in applications like portable refrigerators. The opposite phenomenon, where a voltage exists in a material experiencing different temperatures, is called the Seebeck effect. On paper, this sounds like it would be applicable everywhere. There are temperature differences all around us, and it would be great if we could tap into a bit of that to make usable power. But the problem is that thermoelectric generators just aren't that efficient. In fact, they're just about the least efficient generator around, and part of the problem lies in some fundamental limitations of the materials used. To get started, we need to understand why the Seebeck effect happens in the first place. Let's assume we have a semiconductor and some free electrons. These electrons will always have some random motion if we're above absolute zero. But if the material is at a homogeneous temperature, we can expect there to be no voltage. While an individual electron might be on one side of the material or traveling in a particular direction, everything averages out to zero. If one side of the material is warmer than the other, that isn't necessarily the case. To visualize this in a simplified way, let's assume that each electron can move in just this direction and is bouncing back and forth in the material. Again, if the temperature is uniform, the number of electrons on each side is balanced. Remember though, diffusion is governed by temperature, so if we have a hot and cold side, we basically have a fast and slow side in terms of electron movement. The direction of movement is still random at an individual level, but since electrons tend to diffuse faster at the hot end, they tend to pile up at the colder end. It's kind of like if you were to try to run back and forth on a track and one side was a well-paved surface and the other side was covered in molasses. Even though the time spent running in each direction is equal, you'll still be stuck in the slower side longer. This means that at any given point in time, there's an imbalance of electrons on one side of the material, and an imbalance of charges is basically a voltage. We used electrons in this example, but the same effect can happen with holes, positively charged spaces where electrons are missing that basically act as their own charge carriers. A semiconductor with an abundance of electrons is called n-type, while a semiconductor with an abundance of holes is called p-type. The basic principle of operation in a thermoelectric generator is to have both an n-type and a p-type material experiencing this temperature gradient. The voltages they produce due to the Seebeck effect will be of the opposite sign, and if we connect the cold ends, we have usable electric power. Now that the basics are out of the way, 
Let's think about what makes a good thermoelectric material. Usually thermoelectric materials like this are evaluated by a dimensionless number called the thermoelectric figure of merit, shown here as ZT. This ZT value correlates with overall power generation efficiency, so our goal is to make it as high as possible. The specific components of the ZT value for a certain temperature are electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and the Seebeck coefficient, which is simply how many volts of potential per degree temperature difference. To make materials with a high ZT value, we want to increase electrical conductivity and the Seebeck coefficient, and reduce thermal conductivity. The challenge is that if we look a bit deeper into what constitutes these values, we see that they're all interconnected. Electrical conductivity is pretty simple. It's just the product of carrier concentration, how many electrons or holes there are in the material, and the charge mobility, how easily they can move around. Thermal conductivity can be divided into a contribution from phonons, a unit of vibrational energy, and a contribution from electrons, which can also transfer thermal energy within the material. The Seebeck coefficient is a little harder to visualize, and doesn't break down quite as easily. But in semiconductors, it's generally inversely proportional to carrier concentration. You can probably see the big problem taking shape now. We can employ specific strategies to affect any of these values, but it's going to adversely affect something else. We can increase the carrier concentration through doping processes to improve electrical conductivity, but then our Seebeck will decrease. We can decrease thermal conductivity by making the material porous to better scatter phonons, but then our charge mobility will decrease and our electrical conductivity falls as well. It's basically impossible to change one of these components without affecting the others. This land of constant trade-offs is where thermoelectric researchers live, and it's why thermoelectric material design is such a big challenge. The one advantage of everything being interconnected like this is we can get an idea of where the ideal values for some of these parameters lie. Carrier concentration is a particularly important variable because it affects all three of these key components, so we can calculate where the ideal carrier concentration should be for a conventional material. Unfortunately, the peak is in a somewhat awkward place. A carrier concentration between 10 to the 19 and 10 to the 20 is basically on the border of what constitutes a semiconductor. It's almost a metal at that point. Now we can finally introduce the main character in this saga, silicon germanium. Whenever we talk about semiconducting materials, silicon is usually a good place to start. Part of why it's so ubiquitous in the semiconductor industry is that it's incredibly stable and versatile. To achieve the ideal carrier concentration we talked about earlier, we need to add a lot of extra electrons or extra holes to silicon. This can be done by substituting group 3 or group 5 elements, a process called doping. Group 3 elements have one fewer valence electron than silicon, so if a group 3 element takes the place of a silicon atom, it essentially adds an extra hole. Conversely, group 5 elements have one more valence electron than silicon, giving it an extra electron. The most commonly used elements for this application are boron and phosphorus. We can now make p-type and n-type sides with the ideal carrier concentration. But these doping processes are applicable to pure silicon, so it doesn't explain why silicon germanium is a better thermoelectric material. About 20 atomic percent of germanium is present in the most commonly used composition, and its role isn't quite as obvious at first. You see, part of the problem with using silicon, or any pure semiconducting element, is that typically thermal conductivity is quite high. The phonons that contribute to thermal conductivity generally love crystal lattices that are pure and regularly ordered. That's why a material like diamond is an incredible thermal conductor. It's a pure crystalline element, carbon, connected with strong covalent bonds. 
On the other hand, most plastics are thermally insulating because they're basically made up of amorphous carbon-based chains. Basically, phonons are a periodic vibration, so when you have atoms that are well arranged and all the same, it makes it easy for them to travel. If you put an atom that isn't silicon into this nice arrangement, suddenly it's not so easy. The result is that the thermal conductivity of silicon germanium is over 20 times lower than pure silicon, which is great news for our thermoelectric application. Now before I said there's always a trade-off when optimizing thermoelectric values, and that's still true. But in this case, the huge decrease in thermal conductivity is only slightly offset by other effects. Electrons also like periodic structures, and their journeys can be disturbed by impurities just like the phonons. But from an electronic standpoint, silicon and germanium aren't so different. They're both group 4 elements with identical crystal structures and only slightly different lattice parameters. So at the high carrier concentrations we're talking about, to an electron moving through the lattice, they're almost the same. While thermal conductivity is reduced by a factor of 20, electron mobility is only reduced by about 20%. To an electron, a germanium atom in silicon is only like a speed bump, but to a phonon, it's like a brick wall. The overall result is that we now have everything we could want out of thermoelectric material. The high carrier concentration, complementary p-type and n-type sides, and reduced thermal conductivity. To most of us here on Earth, these thermoelectric properties are pretty inconsequential. Aside from a few extremely niche applications, there almost always are better ways of producing power. But silicon germanium's unique thermoelectric properties were of interest to one particularly important customer, NASA. Silicon germanium has been a staple of their radioisotope thermoelectric generators for decades, most notably for deep space probes. This includes the Voyager 1 probe shown in the intro, launched in 1977 and currently the farthest man-made object from Earth. This probe has enriched our understanding of the cosmos and our place in it. And even now, in 2019, it continues to transmit data all the way back to our tiny blue planet, over four decades after it was first launched. The success story isn't just limited to Voyager, though, because many similar deep space probes share the same material at their heart. Combined, these silicon germanium-based radioisotope thermoelectric generators have logged 250 million device hours without failure. Silicon germanium has traveled a truly unfathomable distance into one of the harshest environments imaginable, and its performance has been literally flawless. But nothing good can truly last forever, and sadly this amazing material is no different. The truth is that, even at the time when Voyager was launched, silicon germanium wasn't strictly the best thermoelectric material from a ZT standpoint. It was used because it was reliable over a broad temperature range, fairly easy to shape, and applicable to both n-type and p-type sides of the generator. But there were always higher performance materials. It's amazing that silicon germanium lasted for as long as it did, but in 2010, NASA announced that the next generation of generators will use alternatives like lead telluride and tags. Thermoelectric materials continue to improve and advance, and although there's still some active research into silicon germanium, there are many alternatives that offer better performance at this point. As Voyager 1 continues to drift out of our solar system, one could say that silicon germanium's time in the sun is over, both literally and figuratively. And like the thermoelectric material that continues to supply it with a small trickle of power, the days of the Voyager 1 probe will sadly come to an end soon. The radioactive element in the generator will continue to get weaker as it decays, and it's expected that by around 2025, it will no longer supply enough power to run any of the probe's instruments. 
After that, Voyager will be effectively dead. The story of Silicon Germanium and the Voyager 1 probe ends here. Or it probably ends here. Because even though we will lose contact with Voyager relatively soon, it will likely continue to drift through space for many, many years. There's a chance, however unimaginably small, that this probe will be discovered by another intelligent species. The Voyager probes carry a golden record that contains sounds and images from Earth, including samples of our languages and music, for just this purpose. There's an overwhelming likelihood that this record will never be discovered, much less understood, but as Carl Sagan put it, the launching of this bottle into the cosmic ocean says something very hopeful about life on this planet. So, even though the material we've been talking about is borderline obsolete at this point, we shouldn't be sad. Silicon Germania may be falling out of favor here on Earth, but in the interstellar medium, it continues to stand as a testament to both our technology and our ideals as humans. This material, this probe, they represent the farthest we've ever gone as a species, both literally and figuratively. And while this boring gray mix of metalloids might not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think about the marvels of space, we should celebrate the story of Silicon Germanium for just how far it has taken us.